Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, writers, biters and firelighters, welcome along to the Joe Spider YouTube channel where we discuss books and little else. And you join me in a uh, typically terrible and overcast day here in uh, Northern Britain for our fifth, sixth, seventh instalment of Nonfiction November, the uh, booktube event organised originally, I believe, by uh, Olive at the Book Olive. Um, wherein uh, the slovenly slobbering idiots that don't read any non-fiction at all are encouraged to read some, and some of you discerning brilliant people that already read some are encouraged essentially just to uh, devote the entirety of the month of November to reading non-fiction. A little bit of um, sort of background, a little bit of admin as per usual for this channel. Um, I took a, uh, as per usual, my, my marvellous uh, sun-kissed soiree weekend on the Adriatic coast in my wealthy heiress's yacht, um, where I consumed uh, enough mind-altering barbiturates to sedate a humpback whale. All was excellent. Came back to Britain just yesterday and found that Piers Morgan has done an interview with Andrew Tate. Um, whose record is um, a little bit of a slimy one. Um, he is, of course, the inevitable consequence, the emblematic inevitable consequence of us prioritising short-form content and um, essentially allowing or ensuring that many, many young, adrenalised, impressionable young men are given access to somebody who is anachronistic, misogynistic and uh, a, a, a misguided and hateful human being. Um, who is so sort of um, cosseted and, and, and so delighted in his own inerrancy and perspicacity, which is obviously not true, um, that he is just willing to spout lies at will. He is currently being, I believe, um, in the process of being convicted for befriending and then pimping and therefore sexually exploiting young women in webcam businesses, um, and for spreading all sorts of, as I say, anachronistic, hateful commentary. And of course, Piers Morgan has interviewed him um, just for recherche shock value and to ensure that uh, Piers Morgan Uncensored continues to get views. Beyond that, I don't think there's an awful lot left to discuss. Um, I don't have, as you know, any sort of uh, uh, basset hounds to jump up on my lap and excite my baying mob of viewers. I just have this, um, again, rather sedate, rather timorous and docile and well-trained uh, uh, small pink hot water bottle um, that, that keeps me nice and warm so I'll, I'll be I'll be clutching that because it's almost certainly minus five degrees Celsius here in Britain at the moment but without further ado we return to the rise and fall of the third Reich, the 19 the late 60s um, huge toe crushing uh, work of non-fiction published by um, William Shearer who was a contemporary American journalist who saw all that went on um, in the early 30s and then the late 30s in uh, Nazi-occupied Germany. Um, and we start off, or we left off essentially in about 1938. Um, it, it becomes very, very clear on the European continent that um, under Hitler's rule, Nazi Germany has abrogated and violated the Treaty of Versailles by continually rearming and... Um, becoming slightly expansive, it seems, and stirring all sorts of uh, uh, political hatred within the country. And so, uh, and, and the deference and cautiousness and um, civility and um, queasiness of some of the Western democracies, um, that, that they're, they're being very soft on Hitler has meant that he feels free to do as he pleases, essentially. So we have... Um, the invasion of Austria, the Anschluss, that's what was covered next in this part two. Um, Mussolini is the official protector of Austria at the time when Hitler wants to invade, but because of um, the ideological underpinnings of Nazism and fascism, uh, Mussolini and Hitler are ideological bedfellows, and so uh, Mussolini isn't the usual uh, uh, international protectorate of a country um, because he's friends with Hitler and so has, has nothing to do with Austria or wants nothing to do with it. Um, Hitler, uh, it's, all the responsibility is then handed over to Chancellor Schuschnigg, I think his name is. Uh, it's given, uh, he's given an ultimatum by Hitler uh, saying, if you do not put uh, Nazi sympathisers into to high ranking positions of power, if you do not essentially make it a, 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 a Nazi state in everything but aim, then I'm going to walk in there, I'm going to pounce in there and I am going to take Austria for mine. Schuschnigg tries his damnedest, tries his best, um, but essentially the, the, the Germans walk in after, after some failed uh, talks and again f through Del, uh, Deladier and Chamberlain's 
Yeah, uh, cautiousness and yeah, understandable cautiousness or caution and uh, unwillingness to be belligerent and go to war. Um, Hitler easily takes uh, Austria. The, um, he's um, um, a preeminence is elected by a plebiscite, which uh, Shira goes and observes uh, and says that essentially there is there is no um, the vote is essentially rigged and that um, every Nazi official is looking over everybody's shoulders so that anybody that does vote makes uh, votes for them and anybody that, that um, looks like they may not vote or encourage not to vote at all. Uh, so that's that. And the Hitler or, uh, has the Anschluss uh, and annexes Austria and has complete control of it. Um, then we move across to Czechoslovakia, which is a very weird concern in and of itself. Hitler essentially characterizes it as a bear poking exercise, tells Czechoslovakia and you know the Western democracies um, um, to the West that he doesn't want war, that he is a you know he's essentially peacemongering, he's not a warmonger. Um, and yes, it says as long as you as long as we aren't provoked, um, we're not going to go into Czechoslovakia. That is obviously not true. Um, you then get the resignations of um, General Beck and then many others who are high-ranking uh, Nazi officials. The um, Beck, for example, is the Army General Chief of Staff. Um, but this is the time where, uh, um, that, that sees an awful lot of the Nazi army under Hitler, some of his uh, advisors and some of his uh, inferiors, um, sort of espousing a little bit of uh, suspicion and criticism and worriment because he doesn't want Hitler to lead them into a disastrous, murderous, ruinous war, which he, which they feel um, will occur because they think that um, Chamberlain and Deladier are not going to over underestimate Hitler and are thus going to go to war if they go into Czechoslovakia. That does not uh, occur and you have um, the Sudetenland taken over, you have the Munich Accords, the Munich meetings of 1938. There is an excellent film which details all of this in much more, uh, with much more uh, uh, theatrical brilliance than I have just done it. It's called uh, Munich, the Edge of War, um, and there's a, a, a good few actors in it. It's on Netflix. It's really, really, really very good. Um, and then you get a, it's it's, it's described very well by Shira. You get a, a, a weird circumstance whereby Chamberlain and Deladier do Hitler's work for him. So, of course, the Munich Accords or the Munich meetings see a bellicose and belligerent Hitler and Mussolini have prearranged ideas and um, assert these ideas and essentially render the whole meeting um, completely obsolete. Uh, it's essentially just Deladier and uh, Chamberlain are there to sign on the dotted line. There is no discussion of much. There is very little climb downs or very little movement from from anybody. Um, it, it it was all a bit processional. I think was the the general gist. Um, but here you have again because Chamberlain and Deladier and you know most people of the age of middle age in Europe at the time remember the bloody murderousness of 1914 to 18. How they lost family members. How they you know saw their friends have their heads chopped off by bullets right in front of them, saw brains gurgling and splurging all over the ground in front of them, saw horses die um, en masse, didn't rightfully and understandably were very, very, very averse to any sort of belligerent action, any sort of, you know, um, um, chest pumping, anything that would seek to disrupt the peace. And the German resistance therefore loses all of its persuasiveness because Hitler, due to Chamberlain and Deladier's um, constantly meeting his um, um, originally peaceful demands, essentially contribute to Hitler's peace, uh, reputation as a, um, um, a peace-demanding leader. And so they cannot garner sufficient support to be able to depose Hitler because, first of all, you've got uh, Goebbels and uh, the propaganda ministry that is obviously just spouting lies and... Um, you know, uh, 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 sort of completely manipulating the, the mindset of, of the German polity. And then, of course, yeah, as I say, you don't have enough evidence that Hitler is going to cause Europe to go to war in order to um, initiate a militaristic uprising. You just don't have that, unfortunately. So the, uh, the Sudetenland is essentially taken over. Um, the underground resistance never really gets much sway at all. Interestingly enough, Comrade Stalin, who um, lives under the emblem of um, Hammer and the Sickle in communist Russia, is not so much, well, Shira uses the word shunned, but for, for a, a multitude of reasons, isn't at Munich. 
Um, this is something which uh, the uh, uh, tyrant ne never never forgets. And before long, they're signing the Nazi-Soviet Pact. So they go into Czechoslovakia, they take to the Sudetenland. Then you've got Poland, which is Hitler's third misdemeanor and transgression, political misdemeanor and transgression, in as many months, essentially. Um, you have... Hitler, uh, sorry, uh, Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, who are um, joint heads, or perhaps they're slightly of different level, at, um, in the Gestapo and the SS, who um, seek to concoct some sort of provocation on Poland's part. So what they do is they make it seem as if, um, first of all, Poland are pretty belligerent and are willing to fight tooth and nail to the end anyway and do not want to initiate any peace negotiations whatsoever. Shearer says that had they been a little more respectful in the face of Nazi tyranny, there might have been a little bit of leeway and perhaps France and Britain might have been able to avert something. Anyway, uh, yeah, Himmler and Heydrich um, make it seem as if Poland have attacked a German radio station, I believe. They take... Inmates of an extermination camp, which were already going on in 38 and 39 in Germany, they take inmates from there, put them in, I think it's, uh, or dead, yeah, dead inmates from the extermination camp, put them in German uniforms and have some other inmates of the extermination camp in Nazi uniforms shoot at those in Polish uniforms that aren't Poles to make it seem as if Poland have attacked Germany at a radio station and thus... Um, supply provocation and um, backing for Hitler's move. This is a terrible, terrible thing. It works, of course, and uh, the Blitzkrieg sees Germany completely romp through Poland inside of two weeks. Um, Hitler, again on the international scene, tries to make it seem as if um, he's acting out of desperation and necessity, when of course it's just his own uh, expansive want. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty despicable and pretty nasty. Um, and then you get what's called a Sitzkrieg in Europe after that. They have declared war on September the 3rd, I believe it is, after the September the 1st, 1939 invasion. And, yeah, yeah, before long, obviously France has got an awful lot more to lose because it is on the continental block, whereas um, Britain is separated by about, I think it's about 15 miles of sea, uh, the channel. And so France has got a little bit more to lose. Germ uh, 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 Britain transport 158,000 troops across. But the, the, the entire French army is uh, ready and waiting, but very little happens. Hitler discusses uh, invading Belgium and Holland, which is where we're at now, on November the 12th, I believe. So, you know, just, just over uh, two months after Poland, he's already looking to get the, the, what's called the Low Countries um, under his grasp as well. And there are many, many, many times in this where Shearer states had the Western democracies not been, had, had they not bent over so very um, um, obsequiously and so strongly um, and so narrow-mindedly to Hitler, if they had actually showed how very strong they were, they, they could have obviously initiated a small early conflict, but would have um, made sure that the, the, the um, bloody worldwide conflict that then later ensued would have been nigh and impossible. Um, and he explains that pretty well. But in terms of the uh, writerly criticism of this, this, I mean, another 300 pages that I've done, I'm on about 650 now. Um, this was a, a stamp and a stodge, I will be honest. Um, it's, it's minute by minute, hour by hour, dissections of certain foreign ministers meeting certain ambassadors, uh, and then, you know, um, Ribbentrop and um, Goering talking to Hitler, and Hitler discussing things with the French government, the French then relaying it to Britain, then Chamberlain sending his foreign secretary across and going to Bergsgarten, and it's it's all very messy, and Shearer feels the need to do every guttural splurt, every single cough and sneeze, every belt tightening, every drink pouring, every single <laughs> atomic aspect of international politics in the late 30s is described in this book. It could be half of the length that it is and still be very um, intricate and very readable. I think it's garrulous and goes on a little bit too much. It's a very, very gnomic section that I didn't not enjoy. It wasn't unenjoyable, um, it, but but there, was, there were, you know, 15 and 20 minute periods where you think, I essentially haven't learned anything and you've gone, you've, you've written 5,000 words, William, you know, what on earth are you doing? And so I've got a, a few examples of that. Um, but I've, got, I've also got a few examples of how, um, how Shearer can still write well. Um, so the first section that I highlighted was 
um, the uh, plebiscite that I or plebiscite that I um, highlighted in uh, when they went into Austria, and there was a vote on um, whether Nazi rule should perpetuate in that country. Um, and Shearer describes it thusly. Uh, in the polling station which I visited in Vienna that Sunday afternoon, wide slits in the corner of the polling booths gave the Nazi election committee sitting a few feet away a good view of how one voted. In the country districts, few bothered or dared to cast their ballots in the secrecy of the booth. They voted openly for all to see. I happened to broadcast at 7.30 that evening, a half hour after the polls had closed, when few votes had been counted. A Nazi official assured me before the broadcast that the Austrians were voting 99% ja. Um... So it wasn't a free election, and of course it was always going to be that Hitler was going to be ushered into power. The next section that I highlighted, um, I, I've been very nice to share. I could have highlighted six or seven bits that are stodgy and boring um, and a little overdone, but I, but I haven't done so. Um, so here we have um, Chamberlain and Deladier's uh, underestimation of it. <sighs> Chamberlain gets so much flack continually historically for his um, subservience and his ignorance of Hitler's true potential at this time. Uh, when my um, uh, dad got home at the weekend and we had a brief chat about what we'd been doing just then, um, obviously I didn't mention my drug taking on the Ad Adriatic coast, but I did mention uh, my um, reading of this book and we talked about Neville Chamberlain and his instant, visceral, unbidden reaction is one of, yeah, pretty much unalloyed hatred. Um, he, yeah, he, he's, he's got a reputation as a, uh, uh, a completely uh, queasy, and um, appeasing little git in this country now, obviously completely um, in the shadow of, of Winston Churchill. But this is Shearer describing him. Um, it was this writer's impression in Berlin from that moment until the end that had Chamberlain frankly told Hitler that Britain would do what it ultimately did in the face of Nazi aggression, the Fuhrer would never have embarked on the adventures which brought on the Second World War, an impression which has been immensely strengthened by the study of the secret German documents. This was the well-meaning Prime Minister's fatal mistake. So. Again, it's, it's completely understandable that Neville wanted to avert war and that he didn't quite uh, understand that you might have had to initiate a very, very, very small conflict in and around Czechoslovakia or, or in the Rhineland with the French or in Austria just to um, clip Hitler's wings a little bit, but he doesn't want to do that. He, he, he is absolutely striving for peace around every corner and essentially that amounts to fellating a completely corrupt and ideologically bent tyrant um, that will that will try to uh, put Europe in his grasp before long. Um, but yeah, as I say, very, very stodgy over the last couple of hundred pages. Um, but we also have to look at some of the resistance that was that was that was eventually stymied, but was was trying to be kindled at one point within the military. Um, so this is General Beck, who was the um, chief of general staff who resigned after Czechoslovakia. Um, but then tried to, as I say, kindle some sort of resistance to Hitler. Um, Beck took his me me memorandum personally to Brauchich and augmented it orally with further proposals for unified action on the part of the army generals should Hitler prove recalcitrant. Specifically, he proposed that in that case, the ranking generals should all resign at once. And for the, for the first time in the third rank, he raised a question which later haunted the Nuremberg trials. Did an officer have a higher allegiance than the one to the Fuhrer? At Nuremberg, dozens of generals excused their war crimes by answering in the negative. They had to obey orders, they said. Uh, but Beck, on July the 16th, held a different view, which he was to press unsuccessfully for the most part to the end. There were limits, he said, to one's allegiance to the Supreme Commander, where conscience, knowledge and responsibility forbade carrying out an order. The generals, he, fe he felt, had reached those limits. If Hitler insisted on war, they should resign in a body. In that case, he argued, a war was impossible since there, there, since there would be nobody to lead the armies. And that is the um, abiding sort of subject and theme that Shearer wants to impress in this section is that many, many, many uh, uh, perspicacious, conscientious, uh, uh, experienced um, tendrils and, and avenues that are on the, uh, the army, many of the, the army departments, military departments, knew that they would have to really, really go through Eastern Europe and any Western Europe section that they wanted very, very quickly. Otherwise, the Great Hill British Navy and um, some of the French and some of the Belgians and any other 
Commonwealth nations that we could involve would soon prove too much. And of course, you've got um, across the pond in the United States, you've got, I think it's Roosevelt that's um, primed and ready to go um, after a little while. And I know it's Hitler that declares war on him, isn't it? But anyway, they're, they're very concerned that it's got to be a quick war, otherwise Germany's going to be overrun. And um, unfortunately, such a resistance is never, never gathered. But yeah, I, this, this section was not, wasn't unenjoyable, as I say, but there were bits where I was just crow's feet, screwing my eyes together, thinking, get on with it, Shearer. You know, I, I, I've already given you four or five hours of my time every day for the next fortnight. I'm already committing an awful lot of time. Please make it, because he, he spends as much time in um, uh, 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 giving birth to Hitler, feeding him, getting him out of his cot, you know, getting into Vienna, um, you know, baking in his vagrancy, and um, I'm talking about all of his ideological underpinnings, he, he, and then his assumption of power as well, um, under von Hindenburg, and after he's got rid of von Papen, he spends as much time talking about the Munich Accords and the years 1936 to 1939 as he does, you know, the entirety of Hitler's 40 years prior to that. And so I know it's important. And I know that there are some people that are going to love the minute by minute uh, examinations and people flying here, here, there and everywhere. Uh, and that's jolly good and fine. But yeah, it was it's a bit stodgy for me. Um, but hopefully now that I mean, we're in, like I say, he's just about to attack uh, Belgium and Holland. Uh, and then you've got the the uh, French white flag raising that will occur soon, I believe. And then, of course, you've got Operation Sea Lion, um, the invasion of Great Britain, which hopefully is going to be um, deliberated upon. And then we've got all the rest of the Second World War. So I'm assuming by the time I get to about Friday and I'm giving you some uh, responses to this, it's going to be a little more exciting. But yes, uh, that pretty much concludes our uh, second little investigation of William Shearer's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Big stodgy toe crusher, the longest book that I've probably ever read um, and will read um, that I am a little indifferent towards just now, but I'm going to plough on for the good of booktube. I feel morally obligated to do so. Um, but yes, I think that just about covers me uh, for today, YouTube. I'm going to go and grab myself a haircut. So I will be, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, as is typical, I will look ready for war the next time you see me because I will have had approximately 70% of this mop trimmed off. Um, but I think uh, I'm just wittering on right now. So I will say thank you, booktube, and goodbye.